Okay? All right. I want to uh, keep going in uh, Sermon on the Mount. I have a couple of things that... Um, I have another Sunday, at least, that I want to... Um, to spend on, on, on this particular topic. So um, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. And that's where we're, eventually we're going to get there, okay? So don't get impatient with me, but Matthew chapter 5. Our text, if you have this, the note sheet, is uh, verses 13 to 16. And I think this is a very unique um, uh, set of scriptures for us, okay? And this, the whole Sermon on the Mount, I think, is very unique. Um, and uh, I, I was thinking the other day, and I was listening to somebody, and I was reading. I have a, a, a resource book that is new to me, and the author is new. And I read his book with a dictionary open on my computer so that I can find out what that word he just used means. Uh, and um, he's very, very scholarly. I'm not. And so I'm trying to figure out what it is that he's trying to say. He made an interesting comment, and I'm going to probably, in a few weeks, share this with you. The Sermon on the Mount starts in Matthew chapter 5. It's the very first teachings that we think. We think it's the first teachings. It's the first teachings we have of Jesus that are recorded. Okay? The last teachings that we have of Jesus that were recorded uh, is in, in Matthew chapter 23. Now, I know some things happened after Matthew 23, but Matthew chapter 5, he starts talking about Blessed, okay, happy. I use the word flourish, all right? How to have a life that is flourishing all the time. How to have a life that is growing. How to have a life that, that is pleasing, that, that, that is happy for you, okay? And so he starts off his teaching in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew 23, there, there are seven, there, remember there are eight Beatitudes in Matthew 5, and... Uh, I think a fly flew in there. I'm sorry. And so in Matthew 23, then there are seven woes where Jesus really confronts the people who had rejected the Sermon on the Mount. All right? He's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and, and they have rejected, and he refers to them seven times in Matthew 23 as hypocrites. Okay? He says, you're hypocrites, you're actors, you're phonies. And he gives seven reasons why they are. And what's interesting is, is that the Beatitudes are all the reasons for why you wouldn't end up being a hypocrite. And so we'll talk about those in a couple of weeks. But in, in, in Matthew 5 is the Sermon on the Mount. You know that I think that the first two verses of Matthew 5 are extremely important. The first two verses of Matthew 5 are an announcement that Jesus is the Messiah. He climbs up the mountain just like Moses did. He sits down to teach just like Moses did. And he teaches the people what God wants them to know just like Moses did. Okay? And Moses promised in Deuteronomy 18. I don't know if that's on, that, on your study sheet or not. But uh, Moses' promise in Deuteronomy 18 is that God, that God would raise up another prophet like him. Because that was messianic. And Moses was talking about the Messiah that was coming. He was talking about Jesus. And so in Matthew 5, Jesus walks up the mountain just as Moses did, sits down just as Moses did, and teaches the people the law or what God wants them to know just as, as Moses did. I think it's an incredible picture uh, for us in Matthew chapter 5. And then what Jesus does is that, that he goes through and he gives the eight Beatitudes. The first four are how to be in right relationship with God. We've got to, come, we've got to learn, okay, and hear me. We have to learn. We have to learn, okay? It is not our nature. I could talk with you for less than a minute and prove to you that it's not your nature to be dependent upon God. That's, that's, easy, that's an easy thing to do. Our nature is we want to be independent. Our nature is we don't want to need any. I was thinking about this uh, a little bit during the night. A couple of times I was awake. I, I've really been sleeping really well. Just Nobody's asked, but I just thought I'd tell you. I've been sleeping really, really well. Uh, it helped that we got away a couple of days earlier in the week. And the whole rest of the week I've been sleeping pretty well. So um, I'm going to leave again for a couple of days and have a good time. All right, so anyway, 
Um, I was thinking about this, about why, because there's a lot of stuff being written today about, about the rejection of the church and the rejection of God uh, in, our, in our culture. Uh, a lot of things are being written uh, about uh, young people not wanting anything to do with church. I understand that, okay? I understand that. Uh, I don't want to take the time to go into it, but I do understand it. And I'm asking God, I'm saying to God, I don't know what to do, but I know you know what to do. Because it's not right. It's not you. It's not God. And so God, there's obviously another force at work and I, you know that too. Uh, and so how do we overcome that force? And so one of the things that I was thinking about is, is that we need to figure out ways to uh, present the gospel for people that are not hurting. How's that? A lot of people say, well, I don't need church right now. Everything's good. I don't need God. My life's really good right now. And so we need, you know, we've always been a church, we've always been people, Christianity has always been, well, I need God. I need God to heal me. I need God to provide. I need God for a job. I need God for peace. I need God for a relationship. I need God, and, and we have all these reasons why we think we need God. But what about those times where we don't really have anything to say to God? We don't have anything to say, God, I need this. I need this. I, what about those times where we're healthy and life's pretty good? And I'm sorry, but there's a whole lot of us that fall in that category where, yeah, there are things that are going on. There are things that maybe we don't like, but life's pretty good for most of us right now. And so do we need God? Yes, we need God. Why do we need God? We need to answer that question. Why do we need God? We need a Savior. We were dead in our sin. He didn't say we were dead in your sickness or dead in your bad relationships or dead in your finances. You were dead in your sin. Jesus talked several times to a group of people and said, you will die in your sin. You will die in your sin. He repeats that over and over in one of the Gospels. And he says, you will die in your sin. We have a sin problem. We may not have an illness problem. We may not have a relationship. We may not have finances. We may not have job problems. But we have a sin problem. And sin will kill us. We will die in our sin without hope of ever being with Christ. And so we've got to figure out how do we do this. And Jesus was coming along and he's saying, look, I can show you how to be in right relationship with God. Be poor in spirit. Be dependent upon God. Be uh, mourn for your sin. Be mournful that your sin caused Christ to have to go and be the ultimate sacrifice. Be mournful for your sin. That sin uh, disrupts your life. That sin leads you down a path that is not of God's choosing for your life. He says, be hungry and thirsty for God. Can I challenge, go, look in uh, verse 3 with me. I'm, I want to challenge you to read these a little bit differently. I know I said in verse 13, and I will get there, I promise. Listen to this. All right, you can read along with me. I'm reading out of the Pew Bible, but I'm going to change one word. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, because they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Because they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they shall be filled. Doesn't that change that for you? I know it says, for they will be filled and for they will be comforted. And I, I, I get that. But when we're poor in spirit and we come with God, God has promised that, that we, will, uh, be, we will inherit the kingdom. We will be comforted. We will be filled. And so we want to come to God poor in spirit because if we come to God poor in spirit, he's going to be able to do things in our lives that, that he couldn't do before. 
Because we were coming to him before and saying, you know, God, everything's really good and uh, I'm really fine. I'm not sick or anything like that. And so I don't really need you. Yes, you do. And so when he says, when you come to me poor in spirit, yours is going to be the kingdom of heaven. Because that's what's going to happen when you come to me and say, God, I'm dependent upon you. But I don't need to be dependent. Yes, you do. Because you can't save yourself. You can't earn your way into the kingdom. You can't earn your way into heaven. And I'm going to tell you another one, because this is pretty common belief. You can't earn your way out of hell. There's a very common teaching out there that hell's not eternal. That you can stay in hell and after you've paid the price for a while, you get out of hell. No, you don't get out of hell. Hell is eternal. This is heaven is eternal. And so we have a sin issue, and we need to come to God because he's the only way that sin issue gets resolved. And we're not going to gain righteousness without God because you and I have no righteousness in us. Why? Because we have a sin nature. And it won't take me long to sit down with somebody and to show you you have a sin nature. I have a sin nature. We all have a sin nature. But the only way to overcome that sin nature is to learn how, and again, I said that word learn, we have to learn this, how to be dependent upon God for everything. Not just when we don't know what to do, not just when we have a problem, but we need to be dependent upon God for each and every day. We need to be grateful to God. I'm grateful that none of us are in a hospital or none of us are in hospice or none of us in ICU or that none of us are stuck somewhere where we need some help. I'm grateful for that. But I also know that that still means we need God. We still need a Savior. We still need the presence of God. We still need his love in our lives. And that's very, uh, very important. Now, just stay, keep your finger in chapter 5, and I want you to go back one chapter into chapter 4, and I want you to look at a couple of verses there with me, okay? In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus had been tempted by Satan, and then he kind of comes along, and he comes out of that, he finishes his 40 days in the wilderness, and he's walking around Galilee, and he's teaching, and he's preaching, and he's healing. We don't know what he taught, we don't know... Who he healed, we just know the Bible says that he did those things, all right? And in verse, seven, uh, verse 17, I, sh I want to show you these two things because it, it's a setup for, verse, for chapter 5. In verse 17, it says that from that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now let me tell you something about the kingdom of heaven. Matthew records uh, his gospel, and he uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. The other gospels will talk about the kingdom of God. It's the same thing, all right? Matthew was writing primarily to Jews. The Jews thought that God's name was so holy, they wouldn't write it and they wouldn't even say it. And so Matthew chose to use the title kingdom of heaven instead of the kingdom of God. They're the same thing, all right? So Jesus is going around, repent for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand. And then look in verse 23, just a few verses down. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. So he's teaching about the kingdom. The Beatitudes are how do you become a part of the kingdom? What do I have to do to be in the kingdom? Do you ever, uh, when you were a kid, do you ever remember somebody saying, well, we're going to start a club. And it's just us three and no more. Or it's a whole bunch of boys and girls can't be a part of our club. Or girls and then boys can't be a part of our club. How do I be a part? Well, what does that do? That makes us want to be a part of the club because we don't want to be left out. 
And we go in crying to mom, dad, they won't let me be a part of their club, you know. And I have a friend who says that his mom always kept a big bag of potato chips nearby. And that when he came in whining and crying about how everybody didn't like him and nobody wanted to play with him, she'd just send him outside with a big bag of potato chips. And I said, you were pretty popular then until you ran out of chips. And he says, yep, every time. Because we want to be a part of something. And Jesus was coming and he was presenting the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And he starts off in chapter 5 with the Beatitudes. He says, here's how to come and be a part of the kingdom of God. He says, the first thing is, you get the relationship with the king right. You announce a dependence on the king. You announce that you're sorry for everything you've done that was sinful. You say, I, I, I'm not going to try to do this on my own. I'm going to be meek, which isn't weak, but I'm going to be meek and I'm going to work under the power of a holy God in order to do what he wants me to do in my life. And so then the second set of Beatitudes is that, that he says, uh, this is how you get along with one another. And it's really cool, all right? He says, you got to be in right relationship with God before you're going to be in right relationship with anybody else, including yourself. You're not going to like yourself until you get right with God. You may think you do, but until you get right with God, everything's messed up. Till you get right with God, you've been playing off a different set of rules. I've always told people that until you get right with God, um, it's going to be, you, because when you're not right with God, it's like you're in a choir and your music is a whole different song than everybody else is singing. Being right with God opens up the door for being right with yourself and for being right with others. Being right with God opens up the door for a good marriage. Being right with God opens up the door for a good relationship with your kids. It, and, and it doesn't mean you're not going to have to work hard at it, but it also opens up the door for a good relationship with your parents. Being right with God opens up the door for good relationships in work. Because it's impossible to be in good relationships outside the realm of God until you're in right relationship with God. That's so important for us. And we miss that a lot. We, 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 we neglect that a lot of times. And again, we, it, it's, it's like one of those deals where, well, when things get bad, then I'll come back to God. No, why? That, that's silly. Stay right with God. Stay dependent upon God. And then allow him to lead you into the right paths that he has prepared for you. If you read the writings of David in the Psalms, he says that, that God prepared my days while I was even still in the womb of my mother. He ordered my days. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have a choice. You can always say yes or no to God's plan. I don't know why you would want to say no, but a lot of us do. So God has these plans that he has established for us. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, don't turn there, but Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says that from the beginnings of time that God established works for us to do. So he had these plans that, that were there. Now, let me get into our text in 13. I, I told you I'd get there. The church has been notorious, as many other institutions, for telling people what to do. Legalism, I've told you stories about how I was raised at times. The church has always had an, a written uh, list sometimes, and sometimes an unwritten list. Usually the unwritten list is longer than the written list. Of to-dos and to-don'ts, Okay? And it's frustrating, especially for those of us who grew up in it. I think, I don't know if I, I, I probably told you the story, but when I was a kid growing up, we weren't allowed to go to movies. Now, you got to stop and think about when I was a kid growing up, okay? I'm old. Not as old as some of you, but I'm old. So the movies, if you go way back into the dinosaur age, the movies weren't really a big deal. 
I mean, I wasn't even allowed at home to watch the three students. These three righteous young men in Curly Mall and Larry who showed us how to live. When I go to grandma's, I could watch them. So I always ended up at grandma's as much as I could. Because she liked them too. Her daughter didn't know. Oh my. So I grew up that way. Couldn't dance. I couldn't square dance. I can't dance now either. I'm happy to walk. You have no idea how happy I am to walk. So when I was 16, I went on the very first missions trip that I'd ever been on. I've told you this story. Everybody else on the missions trip were college kids. University of Illinois, the church that sponsored the trip was from Champaign-Urbana. I was the baby of the group. And so one night they were in this discussion about lifestyles. And it was late and and these college kids were talking about the movies that they were going to. Well, my legalistic righteous indignation rose up. God protected me. I'm sitting there going, you guys are going straight to hell in a handbasket for all those movies that you were going to. And so there were different people making comments about this and about that and about that. And I was thinking, you know, I should really tell them about how wrong they are and all this stuff. But for some reason, I kept my mouth shut. <coughs> the Holy Spirit saved my life by saying, shuttest thou upest. He spoke King James at that time. Because here's what happened. I'm with all these college kids. There were a couple other people too. There was a Cuban man there who was high up in the Cuban government named Raul Foyo. There was an author there that I had just deeply, deeply admired at the age of 16 named Art Katz. Both of them have passed. I have Art's books. And so I'm thinking about, well, why don't you go to movies? Why don't you? Because mommy said not to. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how's that going to play with these college kids? And so I kept my mouth shut. But it was an eye-opening experience because all of a sudden, mommy said not to wasn't sufficient. I needed to figure it out for me, not for her. I remember one time, there is a funny part to that story too. I asked her why she didn't want to just go to movies. She says, well, they do terrible things in the back of the theater. So when I got old enough to go to movies on my own and I started going to the movies, I purposely sat in the back of the theater and I went to her one day and I said, you know, Mom, I've been to this movie, this movie, this movie, this movie, and I've never seen, and I sat in the back and I've never seen anything wrong. I said, what the heck did you do in the theater? <laughs> that didn't play well either. <laughs> I should have listened to the Holy Spirit at that time, keep your mouth shut. But a lot of places have a lot of to-dos and to-don'ts. We're good as a church at saying, well, this is what you should do. This is how you should live. This is where you should go. This is how you should dress. This isn't how you should dress. This is, a, this is what you should drink. This is not what you should drink and all. We're really good at that. And if you fit our rules, you're welcome. And if you don't fit our rules, there's probably another church down the road for you. And God, forgive us for those times. We're good at telling people what to do but we're not good at telling them why they should do those things. Jesus not only tells us what to do with God 
and tell us what to do with one another, but then he gives us some reasons for why. Why do you need to be dependent upon God? Well, the answer to that is to be dependent upon God means that you can be in right relationship with one another. Why is being in right relationship with one another important? And the answer to that is in verse 13. I told you I would get there. Almost at the end. You turn to the person next to you and say, listen to this. This is for you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Let me explain that to you. The salt that the Jews used at this time was not refined. The salt the Jews used at this time came from from marshes. It might have come from the Dead Sea. But when it came and when it was dried out, it was full a lot of times of impurities. The impurities ruined the salt. The impurities changed the flavor. I've been told that salt never loses its saltiness. But impurities that get into the salt will change everything about the salt, will change all of the... the, 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 the uh, uh, workings of the salt, that the impurities, well, when you and I get impurities into our lives, which is easy to do, when we get impurities into our lives, those impurities get in the way of our relationship with God, and anything that gets in the way of our relationship with God gets in the way of our relationship with one another. When impurities come into our lives, and I could rattle them all off, but I don't need to do that because that's between you and God, uh, and you don't need my legalistic uh, point of view of what is impure and what isn't. But when impurities get into our lives and they affect our relationship with God, it immediately has an effect on our marriage, has an effect on our kids, has an effect on our workplace, has an effect on every aspect of our lives. From the music we listen to, from the things we say to the things we watch on TV or in the movies, or there they are again, uh, are all of these things, okay? They affect us when we allow the impurities to come in. It's just like physically when you allow impurities into your body. All right, this little guy that we've been praying for, um, I, Elijah, how old was he, 12 or 13? 16. 16, okay. Elijah somehow or other got something in the lining of his brain that caused a brain abscess and sent an infection throughout his body. That was an impurity. We don't know how it got there. They're working to get rid of it all. But when we get impurities into a wound, we get an infection. And infections will ultimately kill us if we don't resolve them. If we don't work to get the impurities out. The same thing happens when Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. You're this, and, 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 and if the salt gets an impurity in it, it's useless. Now it keeps going. Let's keep going. Look in uh, uh, verse 14. You, all right, remember that person? Okay. You are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill, cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify, excuse me, glorify your Father in heaven. Salt and light, they're metaphors, they're figures of speech that describe the effect that we're supposed to have on the world around us. I was reading some things this past week about salt. Salt adds flavor. We know that. Too much salt's not good for us. A little bit of salt does a lot. Salt preserves in the times of the Bible, which we need to understand. Uh, salt would keep uh, foods uh, preserved for a, a period of time, would keep the bacteria away. Salt aids in the healing process. Uh, uh, and salt makes a difference. I learned this week that salt kills poison ivy. I'm going to go back and cover my backyard with salt. It helps cream whip easily. Do you know that? How many knew that? A little bit of salt and some cream will make it whip easier. 
Okay, and uh, one more thing, and it makes egg whites whip faster and higher. A little bit of salt in some egg whites if you're going to make meringue or something like that, or if you need egg whites, and a little bit of salt will make them whip higher and eat faster. I also learned something else. Sometimes a little salt was used as fertilizer to make things grow. Okay, that's what oh, the scriptures tell us about salt. Salt has a purpose. It makes a difference. Salt also works in our body. Salt, a, a small amount of sodium helps us conduct, conduct nerve impulses, helps us contract and relax muscles, helps us maintain proper balance of water and minerals in your body. Salt is important. And Jesus says to us, you are the salt of the earth and he says you are the light of the world a light exposes obstacles that are hiding in the dark you ever trip over something at night where'd that come from well you left it there okay all right i can just hear pick up after yourself all right the light shows the way it pushes darkness away it helps bring relief from fear one of the things that i learned many many years ago is that sometimes when we get older and sick, we don't sleep at night because we're afraid we're gonna die. Daylight comes, word out. Light removes fear, even of death. It removes fear of disease. It just removes fear most of the time. So the idea of being salt and light was the reason why Jesus wanted us to be dependent upon God. So that you could make a difference. There are a couple of other scriptures, and, and they're on the sheet, and, and we won't turn to them, but, but one of the things that Paul writes about, he says that you are ambassadors. That was fascinating to me that the first American to give a response to the death of Queen Elizabeth II was the ambassador from the United States to England. Before anybody else gave a public uh, statement about her death, they had the ambassador to England from the United States to England making a statement. And so Paul says, you are ambassadors. You are God's representative to the world. That's why he says, you're salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And then Peter writes, and we'll stop with this one, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. We've used this verse so many times. He says, but sanctify, in other words, set apart, okay? Say set apart with me. Set apart, okay, set apart. See, but set apart the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear or respect. We are to live our lives in such a way that those people who are watching us you know people are watching you? You need to understand that. You need to learn that. You need to know that. People who hear you go to church, well, they're going to watch you. What's different about them? Why do they go to church? I don't need to go to church. What do they need to go to church for? They need to know the source of our joy. They need to, I'm, okay, let me back up. They need to see joy in us. They need to see us living peace. They need to see us not perfect, but getting along with one another and our families. They need to see a church that gets along with one another. They need to see a group of people that are not jealous of one another, that are not offended of one another. They need to see us as, as the body of Christ who is dependent upon God and who is in right relationship and who lives Monday to Saturday righteously to set apart God in our lives so that there's a difference in how we live. And it should draw them to us. One of the things that I know about light, if you put a light out in the dark, it won't be long There'll be critters flying to that light. It draws 
some interest. And when you and I, as light, go out into the world, you're going to love this. We ought to be drawing some critters. We ought to be drawing people who need to know about Jesus. Who need to learn how to be dependent upon Jesus so that the rest of their life can be in right order. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the kingdom of God and for the teachings of the kingdom of God that Christ gave us. That the first thing we need to do is to be dependent upon God. So help us today. Forgive us for those times where we've tried to be independent and do it on our own. We've only made a mess out of things when we do that. We've only disrupted relationships. We've disrupted our relationship with you. We've allowed impurities to come into our lives. And we've allowed a bushel basket to be put over us so that nobody can see the light of a holy God. Forgive us. Help us to be salt and to be light. To be the people of God that you have called us out to be. And we'll give you praise and we'll give you thanks for that now.